Hi everybody, my name is Jonathan Gibbs, and the title of my talk today is Cheaper and Cleaner, LNG in a Better Airplane. So, why do we love airplanes? I think there are many reasons, but first and foremost, they allow us to connect with our friends. They definitely allow us to see new places around the world, and they help our economy grow by being able to ship goods across the world at a very quick rate. And who doesn't love airline food? That's a joke. Nobody loves airline food. But everyone does love the views that you get when you take off. There's something visceral about taking off and leaving the earth. So why do we need to be awake? Well, when you take off in an airplane, two types of emissions come out of the engines. Warming emissions and air quality emissions. Now, there are some ways to address these problems, mostly with uh, biofuels, so fuels that are grown from things like algae, and by planting trees. Planting trees helps you get rid of the warming emissions, but it doesn't do anything about the air quality emissions. And in addition to that, all of those nice things only account for 5% of the problem. So what we really need is a solution that, it gets, that uh, addresses the other 95% of the problem. So what happens if we don't do anything and just let things happen? Well, eventually we're going to have to choose between seeing our friends and preserving the environment we'll have to choose between visiting new places around the world and preserving our environment. We'll have to choose between growing our economy and preserving the environment. And nobody wants to do any of those things. So, let's take a look about how far off we are. Everything in the green, we can pretty much accomplish. As, the, as the, you can see on the graph, as the population grows, the emissions grow. And, and the, the technology that we create as airplane manufacturers and how we improve the operations helps bring that curve down. But what we really like to, is to have a situation where as the population grows, the emissions actually decrease. So there's no choice between flying more often and keeping the environment clean. However, in order to get into that blue region where we don't have to choose, we need a new energy source. And I would also volunteer to you that this problem is more of an economic problem than an energy problem. So let's take a look at the economic problem. How much do airplanes improve? Manufacturers typically make new airplanes every 15 to 20 years. And each of those airplanes consumes about 20% less fuel. That's like saying your car consumes 20% less gas. However, all of the new technology that goes into those airplanes adds to the cost of the airplane. And when you add the technology in with the decrease of the fuel savings, you end up saving about 5% when you inflate the previous cost to today's numbers. So that's a good thing. Newer airplanes are cheaper, and that encourages people to buy newer airplanes to save themselves money. But there's also a problem. It's this old airplane. When someone's finished using an old airplane, it doesn't get retired quickly enough. And there's actually a pretty good reason to do this, a pretty, a pretty good business model. An old airplane can be had for almost nearly for free. And when you have it for free, it's nearly 25% cheaper, much five times more than the newer, cleaner aircraft. And it's these older aircraft that are really causing the problem. So what we really need is an energy source that's cheaper, most of all, but also cleaner and lighter. And that's a big problem. So where can we look for inspiration? Well, my favorite example is the Wright brothers. The Wright brothers made the first airplane about 120 years ago, and they had five major breakthroughs. Most inventions usually have one major breakthrough. They, did, they made new flight controls. They did wind tunnel testing. They pioneered very, very efficient propellers. And they also created a way to, for aerodynamic stability so that the plane flies in a straight line. But there's one more that they mastered, and that's energy consumption. Petroleum had only been discovered 50 years prior to the Wright brothers' first flight. And still, engines at the time were still too heavy to fly, fly in. So they didn't give up, and they didn't say it's too hard. What they did was they built a new engine using lightweight materials. And this engine was the lightest engine in the world. It was the fifth, in my opinion, most important breakthrough that the Wright brothers created. And in effect, they mastered a new type of energy consumption. They learned how to consume petroleum, which was a new type of energy that was available. So today, we're going to have to learn to, con to consume a new type of energy. And I think that energy is, is liquid natural gas, LNG. So what is LNG? Here are some LNG molecules, well, really methane molecules. And you can see that they have one carbon and four hydrogens. And the CH bond, the bond between the carbon and the hydrogen, that's the money maker. That's what gives you the energy to fly in combustion, if you remember from your maybe elementary school chemistry class. Now let's look at a jet fuel molecule. 
a jet engine molecule has lots of carbons and some, and some hydrogens, but much more carbons than the natural gas one has. And that's because jet fuel is much easier to, that helps the jet fuel be much less dense and easier to pack into an airplane. So natural gas has more energy and a little bit lighter and jet fuel is more dense. And the problem that, the reason that people didn't use natural gas before is that natural gas takes up a lot of space. So the first way we can solve this problem is to come up with a tank. And this tank is a vacuum decorated tank and we create, and we, we create the gas as a liquid. We convert the gas to a liquid. So inside this tank, the gas is stored as a liquid at a very cold temperature, nearly negative 100, neg literally, literally negative 260 Fahrenheit. And, in, and on the second layer of this tank, you have a vacuum layer which essentially means there's no air inside, and that prevents heat from entering the tank. So, we have something that's lighter, it takes up a little bit more space, and we think this gives us a chance to actually address the problem. In the picture here, you see a balloon on the uh, LNG aircraft because it's lighter, but a little bit more space to symbolize the more drag that it takes up. So, is it cheaper? Well, in 2002, this area, this area is called the Barnett Shale. And it had reserves of about 3.7 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. To put it in perspective, the United States consumes about 20 to 23 trillion cubic feet per year. However, when fracking occurred, these reserves massively increased to 144 trillion cubic feet. So a massive increase in supply and no new consumption for, these, for this uh, new energy source. And that makes the energy a lot cheaper. And that's what gives us a chance to actually replace the crude and those older retired aircraft. Now what about it being cleaner? Natural gas is indeed a fossil fuel, but we have a new clean way to make it. Uh, Bjorn Kavami from Norway discovered a way to sequester carbon in the ocean and get natural gas out. And this is very important because it gives us a chance to pay coal producers to sequester carbon. And currently they can't afford to do that with their current business models. So you pay the coal producers to get their CO2, you put the CO2 in the ocean and you get natural gas back out. This isn't a fairy tale. This is a picture of this part of the process happening in 2013. It was a partnership between the US Department of Energy and ConocoPhillips. And they put CO2 into the ground and got natural gas out. So now we have nearly a carbon neutral way to get this new energy source, which is cleaner and cheaper. So has anyone actually done this before? Well, the answer is yes. The Soviet Union did it in the 1980s during the first oil crisis. They flew a natural gas airplane that was converted. And here on about 100 test flights. You can see here one of the test flights in the photograph. The problem though is that they had to take out these passenger seats to put the fuel tanks in. And this made the aircraft less economically competitive. However, other people noticed, and you can see here, here is a NASA and Lockheed design with a similar idea of putting the fuel in the fuselage and making the fuselage a little bit longer. So as you can see, people have to find a new way to design aircraft. The old design simply won't work for natural gas. So how can we fix this problem? Well, we have to have a new way to design aircraft. If you use the old, air, old way, you might have a fuselage that's too big, or you might have a wing that's too big. But the important thing in this new way, it's kind of a reverse way, is to start with the price. And we know what the price has to be because we know how much old aircraft costs to operate. So if we start with that price, we can grow the aircraft as big as we can, and we never make an aircraft that's too big and too expensive to use. So when you start with the price in, you make the biggest wings you can make, the biggest fuselage you can make, the biggest tanks you can make, and the biggest, and the biggest engines you can make while still going under that price. Now in some of those designs, you might not be able to go far enough, but if you keep on playing with the ratios between those two things, eventually you can find an airplane that also goes far enough and is cheap enough to operate and compete with the older inefficient aircraft. So, what did these new airplanes look like with this new method? Here's a picture of an LNG aircraft. It looks a little bit different than the ones that I showed you earlier. In the red, you can see the fuselage. The fuselage shape is a little bit wider, so in order to keep the cabin volume, but also make room for the tanks, it requires some significant changes. The wing, it's basically the same wing. It doesn't require any changes at all. And the engines, they're pretty much the same engines, but you have to change the combustion nozzle. And this is something that actually happens already when you turn jet engines into power plants. So you just take the jet engine nozzle out and put the natural gas nozzle in. And all of a sudden, you've got an LNG aircraft. Here are some new designs of a fuselage cross-section. This one kind of looks like a mushroom. 
but what you can see is that you get a little bit more cabin room space, so it's good for all of us. <coughs> so, we've learned how to design new aircraft, we've come up with some new shapes for our fuselage to contain the fuel and the passengers. But can we serve all of the aircraft markets? Does it scale up to work on big aircraft and small aircraft? Well, the answer is yes. Here are four aircraft that we've designed that scale the, the entire aviation market. The personal air vehicle, a hybrid electric turboprop, the turbofan transport, which most of us are used to, and even a supersonic airplane with a funny looking design. So let's ask ourselves, is there an energy breakthrough here? Is it cleaner? Absolutely. And in addition to being cleaner, we've got a way to sequester coal, I mean sequester carbon from coal plants. Is it cheaper? Absolutely. We've, we've been able to figure out how to design an aircraft that's cheap enough to compete with older, inefficient aircraft that, have, that are basically acquired for no cost. And does it work in all of the markets? Absolutely. Everything from a small airplane all the way up to something supersonic. So with LNG, we're on the white track. We don't have to choose anymore. Thank you.